Cause I can't do it all by myself But if I'll be honest and let the truth be told I can't do it without God in control He God already knows He knows all of my pain Oh God, He knows Everything about it, yeah. Oh, 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 evening. Hopefully y'all enjoyed that. Um, we'll slow it down just a little bit, sing one verse of a song, and then uh, we'll just keep it going. All right, let's call on Jesus this morning. Jesus, Jesus, sweet Jesus, oh, how I love, how I love to call you. Oh, I said Jesus, Jesus. Sweet Jesus, every day, every day, your name, singing again, y'all, Jesus, come on, sweet, sweet Jesus, how I love, how I love to call you, the sweetest name is Jesus. Troubles around me and it seems I have to despair. When you call you the Lord, you'd always be right there. Yes, it seems like my problems and they they just begun. I I don't worry no more, cause I already won. Come on, y'all sing Jesus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, oh, Jesus, oh, how I love, we love you, Lord, we, 
Will you do you Lord? Come on, Jesus. Come on, y'all. Oh, sweet Jesus. Every day. Every day your name is the same. Everything going on right now. God in your life and you don't even know how. He'll carry you through your storms and he'll forgive you for all of your sins. All you have to do is just let him hold in. Come on, y'all say Jesus. Oh, oh, Jesus. Oh, oh, how I love, how I love to call your name. Jesus, the sweetest name, Jesus, sweetest name. Oh, the only name, the only name every day. Every day, your name. One more time, I say it. Jesus, come on. Jesus, oh Jesus. Oh, how I love, how I love to call. I love your name, Jesus. I love you. Oh, sweet Jesus. Yeah, every day, every day, every day, your name. One more time, one more time, come on, Jesus. Oh, sweet Jesus. Oh, how I love. I'll call you any time of the day. Oh, sweet Jesus, every day, every day, your name is the same. Amen. Jesus, Jesus, I love you. Forever, That's the one. I love you forever. I love you forever, Lord. I love you forever. I love you forever. I love you forever, Lord. Altos. I love you forever. Again. I love you forever. I love you forever. I love you forever. Hey, let's stop that. You know, y'all, acapella singing, y'all, is so hard. You get every note. Let's try this again. And it was probably my fault, y'all. <laughs> Someone said, uh -huh. I love you forever. I love you forever. I love you. Forever. I think that was me, y'all. Answered, I was wrong, man. I love you forever. I love you forever. I love you forever. No, altos. I love you forever. I love you forever. I love you forever. Bring the bass, I love you. Yes, we do, yeah. Forever. One more time, I love you. Forever. I love you. Forever. I love you. 
Come on, y'all. Glory to God. 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 Forever. I love you. Yes. Yes, we do now. Forever. Yeah. We worship you. We worship every day of our lives. Worship you. Yeah. Singing glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. For forever. Glory to God. Glory to God. Yeah. Glory to God. For I love you. I love you. Minutes. Ah, some good songs, y'all. I don't know what to do next. Oh, okay, yes, I do. <coughs> Let's give them, give us, give them some more thanks this morning. Lord, I want to say thank you. Lord, I want to say thank you. I really love you. 
Lord. You took care of me, Lord. You showed me grace. Oh, you showed me grace yesterday. Oh, Lord. I really love you for everything, everything. All you've done, stay right there for all you've done for all. All you've done, thinking about everything that you do for all. All you've done. So much grace and so much strength for all. One more time, one more time, one more time for all you've done for all. All you've done for me. Let the church say amen. Let the church say amen again. Oh, we've made it all the way to the last night of Passion Week. Have you been blessed? I mean, have you really been blessed as we walk through the last week in the earthly life of Jesus Christ? Uh, by now, we have been through the day of teaching. We've been through the day of transition. We've been through the day of trials. And then tonight, we go through the day of torment. And then Saturday, we're going to be silent because he's in the grave. But early Sunday morning, we're going to do the day of transcendence as we get him up from the grave. Is that all right? Let's give yourselves a hand for being here all week long. Amen. I stand before you tonight to introduce a man who needs no introduction. Uh, I affectionately call him the Pope of the Churches of Christ. Uh, he has become the new Pope. Um, uh, uh, right before Dr. Jack Evans died, he laid hands on him and said, you shall assume the papacy. <laughs> uh, in the person of my mentor, Dr. Orpheus J. Hayward, the phenomenal prince of preachers from the Atlanta, Georgia area and the Renaissance Church of Christ, and the mega church. Uh, you all know his ministry shines bright. Dr. Hayward uh, has a multiplicity of uh, terminal degrees, including two doctorates. Uh, not only does he uh, preach for the Renaissance Church of Christ. He also is a professor at David Lipson University. Uh, and then he has his own um, cohort of preaching there. Uh, he does a great job training preachers. And, uh, and so if you are here tonight and this is your first time hearing him, you are in for a treat uh, because he's a powerhouse preacher. And so I am, I am overjoyed. I am honored to have, uh, to be able to call him a mentor. I wasn't happy back when he stuck me in a room for six hours a day with a pile of books. Uh, but what it produced in me, I'm eternally grateful for. Uh, and so uh, he is the proud husband of Sony Haywood and the proud father of two children, Nehemiah and Nevea. Uh, but he's got the same issue I have out of his daughter. And that is, they think that you belong only to them. And so, uh, which is evidenced by the videos of him teaching her to drive, which I've been praying for him in that endeavor. <laughs> uh, but after a verse of another song, the next voice you will hear is that dynamic and powerful preacher uh, from the Atlanta, Georgia, the Renaissance Church, Dr. O.J. Hayden. All right, y'all. Y'all ready to sing with us this evening for Brother Hayward to come up? We're so happy that he's here this evening. <coughs> All right, here we go. Surprise, y'all. Help me out. Someday, 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 someday. Out there, here we go. Peace and joy and happiness, no more sorrow, someday. Peace and joy and happiness, someday, someday. Here we go. 
invited by uh, your illustrious minister, uh, Brother Brandon Mims. I am grateful to God for uh, the effectiveness and efficiency of his ministry. I'm thankful for his friendship, uh, thankful to have been a mentor to him. Uh, I could call him a son, but then I'd feel old. Uh, so I like the word mentor better. Um, and so I'm grateful to God uh, for all that he has accomplished. Uh, Brandon is an intelligent, uh, powerful, uh, oratorically gifted preacher. He's also an excellent church administrator. And the things that he's doing in this space is unparalleled. Um, and I'm grateful to God for what I'm watching him do. So I remember, I was joking with him earlier, uh, him being a young 18 year old, uh, moving about the church building in Atlanta at West End, and uh, who would have known or thought that he would be this today. Um, but he had a brilliant mind, he went off to school, came back, did an intern with me, uh, and as he indicated, uh, forced him to read more books than the law allowed. And, Forced him to become a thinker and to become a student of the text. Uh, my hope for him, as he's doing now, uh, is that he would be a student of the text, that you could trust him with the Bible. Uh, you can't trust every preacher with the Bible. Uh, you can trust Brandon with the Bible, that you will be taught. And, and for that, uh, he is doing well in the tapestry. Uh, of all that I wanted him to become. So he's just been absolutely crazy. It, it was crazy in the office watching him uh, with his daughter. Um, it was just weird for me to see this 18-year-old boy uh, caring for his daughter. And it was just amazing to watch. And so um, I'm grateful, honestly, to just have seen all he's become and all that he continues to do. Um, and, he, and, and I may be his mentor, but sometimes he calls me with excellent advice, and uh, and I great, I'm thankful for what he's doing. I hope and pray that you'll continue to take care of him. Uh, he's a great Moses, and uh, we want you to continue to love on him and to uh, be a support to his ministry. Uh, I'm sure uh, that he is already supported by his lovely wife. I think that's back. She's back there doing what mamas do, uh, and we appreciate her. Uh, man, that's weird. We're looking at that. that, that Sony was doing that back in the day, just uh, trying to keep uh, the children from going crazy. 
and I understand that quite well. Um, and uh, now he's big time preacher with spikes on his sneakers and stuff like that. Uh, he's, he's big time now, man. It's, it's, I appreciate uh, his style and his and what he's doing. Um, I'm protective of him, I, uh, and uh, I've said that ever since he's been in this city uh, that I want you to take care of him because I'm protective of that preacher and just want to see him continue to do well. Now, I I'm almost done. I want you to turn to the Gospel of Matthew. The chapter is 27, and I'm going to commence my reading um, at verse number 47. And I'll culminate that reading um, wherever I stop. That's going to be Matthew chapter 27, commencing at verse 47. And then we'll just uh, see if we'll reach at least to 51. But I just want to set this in a context. <clears throat> and some of those who were standing there, when they heard it, began saying, this man is calling for Elijah. Immediately, one of them ran and taking a sponge, he filled it with sour wine and put it on a reed and gave him a drink. But the rest of them said, let us see whether Elijah will come to save him. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. And behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And the earth shook and the rocks were split. The tombs were open and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they entered the holy city and appeared to many. Now the centurion and those who were with him keeping guard over Jesus when they saw the earthquake and the things that were happening became very frightened and said truly, this was the son of God. I want to put accent on verse 51 where the text says, and behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. I'm going to lift for a subject, access granted. Uh, access granted. Every now and then, I have the opportunity to frequent um, the government building in Atlanta, Georgia, where they have um, dialogues in regards to legislation of law. And one time I was asked to speak in the court chambers as a guest speaker to unfold and set the tone for the days that they would have uh, deliberation about legislation. And so I was walking with a young lady and we came to a door and when we got to the door, it was a high security area. But she was unable to open it. And certainly me being the guest, I too was unable to walk into this high security area. And when she tried to punch in her code, it said access denied. We were then in a situation where time was moving quickly. And she said, if you just wait right here, let me make a call. So she called to a court official that was on the 15th floor. We were on the third floor. And so she had to call for somebody to come from on top to make their way down to where we were. And the person that would come down to where we were had authority that we didn't have. And when this person came down to where we were, they were able to grant us access because they came from on top down to where we are. And when they punched in their code, it said access granted. 
I want to suggest to you that God sent somebody from on top to come down to where you are to give you access to what you didn't have access to. And I thank God that he sent Jesus to fix it where he could provide access granted. I want to look very carefully within the context of the climactic moment of Jesus' life whereby he functions as a substitutionary sacrifice. It is true that all of the synoptic gospels, including John, record this climactic day where Jesus functions as our substitutionary sacrifice. I say substitutionary because Jesus took our place in addition to the, being the one who died this crazy and unfortunate kind of death. But I want to look at Matthew's account carefully in as much as Matthew's uh, focus is on the fact that Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. So when you're reading the book of Matthew, you are watching this synoptic outline for us that this is the Jesus that had right to the throne of David. And so he begins, unlike any other gospel writer, and he quotes a genealogical argument as proof that Jesus was the son of David and the son of Abraham. When you get to this climactic week, however, you will find that Jesus, while on the cross, several events begin to unfold to which the writer, Matthew, invites us to behold. He uses that word behold from the Greek word ado, which simply means to pay attention. He uses that word 45 times in the book of Matthew, to bring attention to that which was taking place. Sometimes he'll say, behold, other times it's translated suddenly. And so there are times when Matthew will say, behold, look, or suddenly, in order to bring the reader's attention to the specificity of the thing that he's beginning to unfold. So here in this context, you'll find with Jesus, while on the cross, after saying, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? things begin to unfold to which he wants us to look, to pay attention. While Jesus is on the cross, he says in verse number 50, or Matthew says, and Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. And then the first word in verse 51 is, behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And the earth shook and the rocks split and the tombs were open and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised and coming out of the tombs after his resurrection they entered the holy city and it appeared to many now when the centurion saw these events and beheld the earthquake and saw all that was taking place with the veil being split the bible says he declared, truly, this is Son of God. Now, I want to suggest to you in verse 51, where I want to place accent, I want to pay attention to what Matthew asked us to pay attention to. Behold, when Jesus yielded up the ghost, the Bible says the veil of the temple split from top to bottom. I want to evaluate the theology of this text to understand the significance of what Matthew said, behold. Now, what is the significance of a veil being rent or split from top to bottom? Well, I want you to be mindful that this veil that was in the second temple has interesting Jewish historical significance. Now, I want to suggest to you that this idea of a veil begins in an object called the tabernacle. When one studies the tabernacle, the tabernacle was a tent, and the tent of the tabernacle uh, had a fence that went around the area in which it enclosed. Now, when you understand that, as recorded in um, Exodus chapter 25 and 26, 
there was only one way in to the tabernacle. Now, I don't have time to deal with one way in, but there was one way in to the tabernacle. You weren't supposed to climb over the fence some other way, but you came in one way to get into the tabernacle. When you enter the tabernacle, one had to then exercise an animal sacrifice. That meant you could not come into the presence of God unless there was the shedding of blood. If there is no shedding of blood, you cannot come into God's presence. But then they would have to walk further and run into an object called the laver. And the labor was the place where the priests wash. Because if you're going to come into the presence of God, you got to come by blood and water. Otherwise, a person cannot come into God's presence. But once you enter into God's presence, you come into a place called the holy place. Now, the holy place had three pieces of furniture. It had the golden candlesticks, um, seven golden candlesticks um, that would light up the area. And then you had across from that a table of shoe bread or the table of presents. And you also had another golden table called the table of incense. Incense represented prayer. The shoe bread represented fellowship. And the candlesticks represented light. You had in the holy place light, prayer, and fellowship in what's called the holy place. But there was another object that separated the holy place from the most holy place. And it was called a veil. That veil hung on four pillars, uh, four pillars that were overlaid with gold made of achia wood. And not only that, but it was woven into a tapestry in which scholars would have it that the veil was at least the width of a person's hand from palm to fingertip. So this was not a thin kind of cloth, but it was a thick kind of woven object. And on the object in the original, you had a cherubim uh, that was pasted onto this particular veil that represent guardianship. Now, in other words, uh, nobody could go past this veil. And the only time a person could go past the veil is the high priest once a year. So one time a year, God's high priest could go past the veil. He would go past the veil into where God's presence would show up. Now, in the holy, most holy place, you had an Ark of the Covenant. Inside of the Ark, you had two tables of stone. You had Aaron's rod that budded. And on top of that box was a lid called the mercy seat. Now, the mercy seat covered the law. Don't have time to deal with that. The law was inside the Ark. But thank God there was a lid that covered that thing in which there was mercy that covered the law. I, I'm, I don't have time to fool with that, except to say I'm glad that God uh, gave a law, but I'm grateful that mercy covered what was inside of the ark. Then you had two cherubims on both sides of this ark, and that's where God would show up. But once a year, the high priest went in because nobody else could enter past that veil. When Christ died on the cross, the veil of the temple was ripped from top to bottom. This thick object, this six-foot veil, 30 feet wide, was ripped from the top to the bottom at the time that Christ said, it is finished. At the time that he gave up the ghost, God rent that temple, which meant that there was access into the presence of God. I'm glad when Jesus died, he granted me access. I'm glad when he died, he fixed it. 
where there's no more barrier between me and God. Now, 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 do you understand that? Um, I'm almost done. I promise. Um, the veil was the width of a hand. Well, uh, scholars suggest, um, probably in hyperbolic language, they said 82 women it would take to, in order to do the tapestry of this veil. In hyperbolic language, in the Mishnah, it suggested 300 priests would have to take it down and wash it from the blood. All of that language is suggesting is that this particular veil was thick in nature. What does that mean? No man could have rent this veil because of the thickness. But to add insult to injury, God rent it not from the bottom to the top, but he rent it from the top to the bottom as an indication that this was a divine intervention. Now, now, now that you get that, I want to make sure we put this in theological context. What does the veil indicate? Well, it indicates access grant. But in what sense? I'm going to show you that there are at least two senses where the, the veil represents access grant. The first way you can write it down is it proves that Jesus operated or would operate as a forerunner that would be the first to enter through the veil symbolic of him passing into heaven. Now, I want to make sure I get that in your spirit. What, what, it, what the, the theology of it is, Christ is a forerunner that would pass through the veil symbolic of him passing into heaven. Now, I need you to get that because uh, I want you to be clear in your mind that Christ represents our high priest. And just like the high priest once a year passed through the veil, Christ passed through the heavens to get into the presence of Almighty God. Now, I want you to turn your Bible to Hebrews chapter 4. I want you to look at Hebrews chapter 4 so that you can get the theology of this thing. Hebrews chapter 4, praise the mighty name of Jesus. And, and I want to look at verse number 14. Watch the text now. In verse number 14. Uh, Therefore, since we have, here it is, a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. What did Jesus do? I want you to see that Christ passed through the heavens just like the high priest passed through the veil. And now we see that on the right hand of God, he's mediating on your behalf. I, I think I read somewhere that he's able to be touched with the feeling of our infirmity, yet without sin. And he's tempted in all points. Then it says, let us come boldly to the throne of grace. Why? Because there's a high priest that passed through the heaven. Now he's seated on the right hand of God. And now he's the mediator. Oh, if I had time, I would show you. But this ain't my turn. But this ain't my turn. But I would show you that when Jesus goes to heaven, he goes to heaven as a man. As a God. He was God in the flesh. Uh, and he gets up as a man. Not only does he get up as a man, he shows himself alive as a man. And then he ascends to heaven as a man. And the thing that happened on his way up, he became a glorified man. Which means he's God in the flesh in glorified form, sitting on the right hand of God as a God-man. 
the reason he can feel the temptation is because this man came to town and he functioned as a man, tempted as a man, went back to glory as a man, sitting on the right hand as a man. Here's your prayers, pleads to the Father, says, I've been where they've been. I know their struggle. I know the temptation. Thank God there's a man sitting on the right hand of God. First Timothy chapter 2 and verse 5 says there's one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. There's a man that mediates. Well, that's not why I went there. But, but this text shows he passed. So when you see Jesus die, Jesus is also predicting what he's about to do when the veil gets rent. What you going to do, Jesus? I'm going to pass. Do the heaven sound. But he's also a forerunner. Now turn your Bible. I need you to get Hebrews 6. Hebrews chapter 6. Praise God. And I need 19 and 20. Hebrews chapter 6. Verse number 19 and 20. Watch that. Ah, let's get the whole thought. Ah, in the same, I'm reading verse 17. In the same way, God desired even more to show to the heirs of promise. The unchangeableness of his purpose interposed with an oath so that by two unchangeable things in which it was impossible for God to lie, we who have taken refuge would have strong encouragement to take hold of the hope set before us. This hope we have an anchor of the soul as hope both sure and steadfast and one which enters within the veil where Jesus has entered as a forerunner for us. Now, Jesus passed through the heavens, but he passed through the heavens as my John the Baptist. He's a forerunner, which means he'll go, but he's preparing for me to come later. He prepared a way for me to get back to God. And as the Messiah becomes my John the Baptist. That says I'll go fast. But I'm going that you might come later. Thank God that Jesus didn't go himself. But fixed it. Where one day I will come with him. Because he's a forerunner that passed through the veil. Well, I praise God. But, but that's not all. I got to give you a third, third one and I'm done. Look at Hebrews, Hebrews 6. He, he passed through the heaven. He was a forerunner going through the veil. But I want to give you another perspective of what that veil is. Oh, God, put these scriptures on the screen. Okay. I know that. I'm working harder than I need. Uh, look, at, get Hebrews 10. Praise God. Verse 19 and 20. Hebrews 10, verse 19 and 20. Y'all going to do that? All right, let's see what we got. Yeah, 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 yeah. Ah, watch this. Have mercy. Now, this is where I'm going to try not to run around the world. This one always get me. This, this one right here. Having, therefore, both. To enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. Watch verse 20. Uh, by a new and living way. Not by dead sacrifice. But a living way. Christ having given his life as a blood sacrifice. Watch this. Which he has consecrated for us. Through the veil. That is to say. His flesh. Now. Not only did he go through the veil. But he is the veil. So when Christ. Died. That was Christ. Being rent. His suffering. 
was the way that God got in. Thank God that he was willing to suffer as my veil. And when Christ suffered, that was the veil being rent. Oh, Jesus, help me. When he's not only the one who entered the veil, but he is. When Jesus is tired, every aspect of his suffering is an indication he was my veil that God ran. Because he suffered, he made a way into the presence of God. Jesus suffers in the garden. So agonized that Luke said there came from him as if it were great drops of blood. Possibly, Luke being a physician could be giving us a look at the level of stress that is weighing on Jesus because there is a condition called hematic drosis, which is when blood sweeps into the blood into the sweat capillary. And a person sweating may also be an indication of the fact that blood is now showing up in the sweat because the sweat gland is bleeding into the vessel to which now you see a reddish color in the sweat that's coming from the blood. Possibly, that's what Luke said. I know the agony is of such that he becomes exhausted and he falls to his face while he's praying and said, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine will be done. He prays that three times on his face, which indicates the agony in which Christ is suffering. Why are you doing it, Jesus? Because I've got to be rent in order for you to have access. Sometimes there's a cup that we don't want to drink. Sometimes glory is on the other side of the cup that you've got to take in. So he is now in the agony of sweating, stress, and microdosis, which makes the body vulnerable to its skin being easily broken. Jesus is now led into the space where he will be beaten. And they would take the whips and weave it with either bone fragments or metal. So that when the whip would hit the body, it would remove flesh where every hit that takes place. So what are you doing, Jesus? I'm being rent that you might have access. And so it is that Christ. They took six inch nails, pierced it through the base of his hand, running the metal object through two bones by which we get a new word called excruciating, which in its original etymology means out of the cross. So Jesus hanged with nails in his feet and in the base of his feet. And he's hung in an asphyxiated position. Asphyxiation means a posture of suffocation. And in order for Jesus to breathe, he has to push up on the nail, pull up with his hands, 
so that he can inhale and exhale. And every time he pushed up, he had something to say. Pulled up and told the thief, today, he'll be with me in paradise. Trump back down, pulled up and said, I first, because he's got to fulfill scripture. Slunk back down. But I thank God when he pulled up the last time, he said, it is finished. I have accomplished what I've come to do. And I've read the veil from top to bottom. And you now have access. And the only thing I can say to you as I'm done is access granted. And if you're here today, I hope and pray that you are prepared if you're visiting to give your life to Jesus. But if you're a Christian child of God, may you remember the faith. Every time this time of year comes, you're reminded that someone gave you access. That's what this is about. And I don't know about y'all, you know, this is <laughs> in my younger years when I preached this, I just thought it was good information. But after you live a while and realize how unworthy you are, good friend. After you live around for a little while, you've done some wrong stuff, and you realize how much you don't measure up, and you recognize that if God left you to yourself, you would never have access. This hits different when you interpret it in light of your life. So I'm grateful he gave somebody as crazy as you access. And I can say I'm on my way to heaven. The only thing that would be a sad story is if you get granted access and never go through. I would hate for you to say no with an open door. One thing when the door's closed, but to deny access with an open door is a slap in the face. No wonder he says, to you who are troubled, rest your back. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty name, taking vengeance on them that know not God and did not obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. I, I think I understand why he did this. Because if you did all that for somebody, for them to say no, one day you'll have to answer for your life. Can I give the invitation, Brandon? If you're here and you want prayer, I want you to come. You know why you should pray? Because you got access. That's what makes prayer powerful. Is that you have access. And I will give you prayer. I want you to come on and get prayer. If you want to be baptized, stay with us one more second. Give your life to the master. If you're just going to pray, I want you to do something else. If you're new, you come on. We'll pray for the master. Believe. Repent of your sin. Confess Christ and be baptized. Today will be your day. As we together stand and sing the song of the invitation. The one you saved has come to honor you. The one you saved has come to worship you. You are my Savior. Oh, thank you for being my Savior. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for being my Savior. The one you say, the one you say, 
has come to honor you. It's the one you say, the one you say, yeah, Lord. has come to worship you. Healer, you, you are my healer. Oh, you are my healer. Thank you, Lord, for healing me. You are my healer. Thank you, Lord. Oh, 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 you are my healer. Healer. The one you healed has come to honor you. The one you healed has come to worship you. You are my father and you are my father. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for being my father. Thank you, Lord, for being my father, Lord. Oh, everything, Father, my Father, the one you say, the one you say, has come to honor you. The one you say, the one you say, has come to worship you. The one you say, the one you say. Has come to honor you. The one you say, the one you say, has come to worship you. I have several prayer requests this morning, or this tonight. Uh, the first comes from Sister Hicks, and she's asking prayers for Jackson, who has been sick for, for three days, and she's praying that his feet will break. We also have Sister Thornton, who's asking prayers for her daughter-in-law. And Sister Kiki Robinson is asking prayers for her family. Her uncle Ronnie has passed for her father, who is still sick. Let us pray. Father God in heaven, we come to you and we first thank you for what you have done in our lives. Thank you, Father, that you were born. With that access, we come to you tonight on behalf of those who are standing on the line. Father, we, we don't know all of your plans, but we do. Because we have a high purpose to work with you and your power. So, Lord, we come, we pray for those who have lost loved ones, for those who are ill, for those who are needing your provision, for those who are praying and for others. Father, we just ask that you would put your arms around all of us and take us where we need to go. Father, we thank you for the man of God who came to us all from the laboratory to teach us more about the bed than we ever knew we needed to know. Thank you, Lord, that you sent your son to die for us. Father, we ask that you would bless him as he goes back to his home and finds it the way he wants. We pray for his family that they support his ministry and share him with the world. Lord, we thank you for the gift that you've given him and we ask that you would bless him. And Father, as we close this prayer tonight, we just thank you for being God all by yourself. Thank you for passion. We thank you for the last week in the life of Jesus. But most of all, thank you for the life of Jesus. And beyond that, the sacrifice of Jesus. And above that, the resurrection of Jesus. And for us, without which none of this would be possible. So, Lord, we thank you, we thank you, we thank you. It is in the mighty name of your Son we pray. Amen. Amen. Church, amen. Yes. Amen. All right. It is our offering time. This is your almost last offering of the week. Well, I guess Sunday is a new week, so this is the last offering of the week. Amen. We thank y'all so much. Y'all know what we do. We fast during the day and give our lunch money to the Lord uh, just so that we can help to support this pastor's week. Has this not been a phenomenal week, y'all? Let's give the man of God a hand.
appreciate him so much for coming. And I told him, I said, Doc, you got to come and want to get a big <laughs> He got a tour of the country, you know, check on his, his, his regions and jurisdictions. <laughs> See, I'm one of the under bishops. He's the, the big bishop. I'm an under bishop. You got to come and check on the under bishops, make sure he's doing right. <laughs> We're going to have a verse of a song and then we're going to pick up the song. Thank you, thank you, Lord. We thank you. Thank you, we thank you, Lord. Lord. And Lord, we say thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Oh, I'm to tell you things I, I'm trying to say you, cause you've been so good, Lord, you've been, you've been so good, you've been so good, even though I didn't deserve it in you, you've been, you've been so good, and all I know you've been. You've been so, you've been so good, and I just want to tell you, babe, oh, yes, well, could you save my soul, you save, you save my you saved my soul when I was out there doing wrong. You saved, you saved my heart, you saved my soul. And oh, I owe you, Lord, and you saved, you saved my heart, you saved my soul. And I just want to tell you things. I just want to thank you, Lord. Oh, Y'all sing it all tomorrow. Just suck on some lemons all day and then uh, so we can get ready for Sunday morning. Amen. But they've done a fantastic job. We appreciate it so very much. Uh, a couple of preachers in the back. Good to see Dr. Provost here again. Or uh, Dr. Harris in the back. Well, he got the real doctor. Dr. Harris in the back. And then Dr. Lamont Evans in the far back. Good to see the preachers who have come out uh, this week. Always good to see them come out uh, to support. We appreciate it so very much. I think I have a couple of things. Let the words of my mouth, the meditation of my heart, be acceptable in your sight. Oh, Lord, my strength and my redeemer, you are dismissed.